dear everybody, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome all of you to the University of Oslo, even though you've been here one day. Uh, and first of all, this is Evelyn's work, Evelyn's mission, Evelyn's life, that has uh, inspired me and all of you to gather and uh, work in uh, trying to make the world a better place. Uh, being a university leader, um, one could do a lot of things. One could uh, try to uh, have a lot of students so that you can have a good economy. You can try to uh, be uh, uh, best among the rankings, uh, international rankings. Um, there's a lot of things you can do, so we have to prioritize. And um, what I've been doing as a university leader is trying to uh, look at the goal of the mission of a university. What is the mission of a university? What is the core of a university? And, uh, that is to uh, educate morally dignified students. And uh, that people may read some research articles. But facts are very soon forgotten. We all know that facts are very soon forgotten. So what do you have to do then if you for forget a lot of the things that you learn? You have to try to make the students and the academic staff to reflect, to be critical, to be ethical, to be aware of how the others think and speak and act. That's the mission of the university. It's to um, educate uh, morally reflected and critical individuals. So how do you do that? By talking? No, not really. Sometimes you can inspire by words. By acting, yes. By really trying to be a role model in everyday life. Every minute you have to try to think how you act. And uh, I'm very aware of the people that speak with loud voice, that little bit shy. You know, the students that sit at the back of the room, a little anxious to ri raise their ha hands. The ones that have an angry father, and they are afraid to go to school. You have to be aware of how people react in everyday life, every minute. You have to be aware. And as a teacher, as a lecturer, I think that the most important thing is to make people throw themselves out into the unknown. <laughs> I'll call it an forvirringens uh, hav. Uh, it's an um, ocean of um, uh, confusion. Uh, and I'm also a philosopher, so we, we like to be in the, the unsecure. The, um, to, to, uh, when you learn to bicycle, the first days before you learn to bicycle, you are a bit, you know, you're not, you're not learning it and you're falling off. So I think that the students and also the staff, they have to be pushed a little bit so they f fall. They don't know how to, to ride the bicycle. And to be, uh, to be there with them, trying to, uh, to uh, put questions in different perspectives, to... Um, to disturb people morally and intellectually is the most important mission. Try to see what if you were born in another part of the world? What if you had tried to imagine, tried to imagine what would life look like? So to morally disturb the students and the fellow academics and friends and neighbors and so on, I think that's 
one of the things that we could try to do better. Um, and I work a lot with, uh, with teachers in primary school and secondary school, and we have this perspective uh, internalized like a method, like a form of pedagogy. And uh, from primary school and uh, up to the university and even in university, for me it's a kind of <coughs> the philosoph philosophy I've learned when I took my PhD and my doctoral thesis. It's all about really trying to ask the most difficult questions. And it sounds easy, but it's not. I think that it's too much answer and it's, too, it's not enough questions. And uh, the only way that we can learn something new is by trying to raise new questions. Look at concepts, dignity, what is dignity? What really does it mean? <coughs> so um, this Dignity University, I feel I should have done more, you know, Evelyn. I feel I should have done even more to try to develop Dignity University. But I have this dream and I know that we will make it. We will make it together, Dignity University. And it's such a marvelous good idea that free lectures about these issues to, to all people in the world. So together with you, I think we can, I know we can make it. Uh, and next year I will have more time, so I will really dedicate myself to work with Dignity University. <coughs> yeah! <laughs> so, um, this autumn we started up with a lecture here at the University of Oslo called Global Citizen. And uh, Global Citizen. Global Citizen. Last week we had three warm-up lectures open to the public, to all students. And the first lecture was about world citizenship. What is that? Where does the concept come from historically? Um, and there was a lecture about the concept of the world. The world from, from the ancient times, uh, the concept of uh, in Greek mythology that the world was uh, the globe that you ho held in your hand until uh, Google now. Uh, <laughs> you see the world in much the same way. And it's a concept that the world is a kind of material thing. So what does that mean that we have this concept of the world as a material thing? That we can, we can sell and we can exploit and so on. What does that mean? And the third lecture was about um, the balance between local awareness and global connectedness. And this whole autumn, Nina will speak as well. We will have lectures on global citizenship because we want all our students that come to the university for the first time are forced to reflect about what does it mean to be a global citizen to be a part of the world and to defend your own upbringing and your history and your language. Like Celia is uh, now uh, engaged, uh, or have been uh, researching in Tanzania and Zanzibar about the very important aspect of having your own language in school, your mother tongue, and what is the rights in education as Celia speaks about. Uh, so we want all our students to reflect the first semester about being a global citizen. I don't think I will say much more now. Uh, I have not prepared, but I will try to, uh, to speak in, uh, later, maybe uh, also tomorrow. Uh, welcome again. I'm not too proud of the weather today, but uh, I think that this building, the university library, is very fitting for the meeting of the global Dignity University, because it's a library and we have with us uh, the whole history 
and it's also open and it's red walls i love red it's very uh, empowering <laughs> so uh, have a nice day and thank you all thank you so much thank you so very much uh, you know that i'm a proud carrier of a world passport <laughs> I would like to introduce Carmen now. Carmen, could you come? Many of you have now met Carmen already. Uh, Uli and I, we met him in last year in August in New Zealand. He is the bearer of oral Maori indigenous wisdom and he will explain more. Kia ora. <laughs> I uh, usually, um, my orators, where I come from, they, they start to do the oratory from where they're sitting, all the way up here. But she keeps telling me to come into the, to the frame for here, so other people can see. So um, I, my, my elders who taught me, none of them get filmed. Um, other cultures have wanted to film them, but um, we, we believe that our culture, to feel the spirit of what we're saying, we have to be kanohi kite kanohi, which means you have to have my eyes, and I have your eyes, and I'll have your heart and your soul. Because we believe that truth is like the light that comes from the sun, that gives light to your eyes and quickens your understanding. Because to us, life, light is spirit, and spirit is everything to do with the Creator. So um, I'll start, I wish I could have done it from there, but I know by the time I got up here, she would have been saying, hey, no, no, start and do it again. <laughs> but um, what, I, what I'll do is I'll, I'll do it in my language because it's a prayer. And I, I'm, uh, culturally, I'm not used to starting anything um, without a prayer, like gatherings like this. Our, our people, they sing. Um, you have usually three or four speakers um, that can take all your time of the whole day if they want to. And then you have singers that support each speaker and, and to us, within all of those protocols of welcoming, um, everybody should be edified and uplifted. A bit like church, when people go to church on a Sunday, but our people did it every day. So um, I'll, gi I'll give this, um, this, this prayer and then I'll explain it. Uh, don't worry if you have a hearing aid, just turn it down a little bit because we, we don't have uh, speakers either. So we use a loud voice so everyone can hear. Wero hia ki papa tuanuku, wero hia ki te tai, he tuhi marae kura ki te ao tūroa, turu turu ana ki te tai, turu turu ana ki uta, ko na tohu e toro e amakura, he kore ro tia nei, hakarongo ki te tangi a te manu e karanga nei, Tui, tui, tu tuia. Hui, 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 hui. Hui, i te kawa i tangata i heke mai i Hawaii ki nui, i Hawaii ki roa, i Hawaii ki pā mama o hono ki wairu ati hewa. Mauri ora. So I'll explain what that is. Um, the first words is about an ancestor who was a prophet. A mate kite we call, which means that he could see things from our past, where we've all come from, our present and into the future. And that's what we believe um, our righteous ancestor can do. Somebody who practices righteous dominion among his people. Because I've, I've like loved all of the dialogue that's gone down here. Listening to all of our learned ones, our elders that are here. And I've just been uh, filled up yesterday by the things that they've shared about words that I didn't even know about banality of ser servility. See, I'm only just struggling with them. The Lord Syndrome. But I wanted to say that in our past, in our culture, everything that we've recorded has only been from our righteous ancestors because they're the only things that are going to lead us to peace and harmony. So in this, uh, this prayer that I did, it was about an ancestor that we call Tāne Atua. And he was chosen of the Creator. And his prayers had the power that, you say, we do here, ki papa tūnuku, a challenge was given to the land and to the sea to cause the sea to pass. 
if you've heard these stories before, I'm happy. But these stories were told before the coming of the Bible. Uh, if any of you have been to Hawaii, there's a, a place there, a big shopping mall they call Ala Moana. Ala Moana means the, uh, Ala Moana means the sea path. It's a design you see like this throughout Polynesia. It's, it's a wave like this, but it's a pathway, a pathway through the sea. It's the most common design throughout the whole of, um, of Te Moana Nui, which is Polynesia. So I just wanted to say that that's what it's acknowledging. The power of a righteous ancestor that divided the sea and caused people to go through. The next part says to listen to the sound of this voice, this particular voice. And this particular voice, what it would do, it would have the power to bring all people together. All people that the Creator had led to all these different lands. And it would bring us together as one. And when we, when we come together as one, what it would do, it would be able to do a lineage of our ancestry right back to all of the, um, the distances that we've traveled from. So we believe in Aotearoa, where we come from, they call us canoe people. They say that we've got these little canoes that we got around the Pacific. And if you come to my country, you'll see canoes that held 200 people. That's a single piece of log that has 200 people on it. Our ancestors traveled on canoes that were um, lashed together, twin holes, that, hold, that held, we, we believe that they held like thousands of people. So, but, but see, once again, we have scientists telling us who we are instead of listening to us tell our story of who we are. Hegemony. So I, I'll just say this. Um, so what we believe is we're one of the world's greatest travelers that the creators led to the lands that we, that we inhabit. And we believe that we've inherited those lands like all the people of the world um, for a place of our inheritance, a place for us, for our children, our prodigy. So what it says there, it does, uh, that story there, that prayer, does a lineage from Aotearoa, from New Zealand, right back into Tahiti, Samoa, Raratonga, if you know that part of the world, and it goes back into Hawaii. It goes back into the Easter Islands, Rapa Nui. Those are the traditional names that we know. Because we can do our ancestry. If we had time, I'd do it myself. I could go 76 generations on my mother's and my father's side. It's requisite that before I speak to you, I'm able to do that. If I can't do that, well, then I don't really... Um, I can be asked to speak by another elder. That's just... Uh, what the, why they do that is so that you're not led by um, what we believe like turkeys. That you don't have a turkey get up and try to try to uh, shape you and tell you about your culture so that you know what you're talking about. So the lineage will take you on a voyage of three degrees of distance for me as a Māori, a native of New Zealand, right back to the place where my first parents were created. And that's the first mother and the first father. So that's the lineage that we have. And um, I thought the easiest way to do it was through the symbolism um, I just wanted to say that's the opening of my speech and my time's nearly all gone. <laughs> but we come from oral history. And um, I just wanted to acknowledge the, the theme of this conference, um, you know, the aftermath. And, um, and not many people know, I didn't know until three days before I came here, but the youngest victim was a 14-year-old girl. I have her name in my bag. I can't even say her name. But she's half Māori. Um, her body took five days to find. So back in Aotearoa, her mother, who's Māori, everyone had to wait there for five days before they, they feared the worst, but after five days they found that she was the youngest victim. So um, when I was invited to come here, uh, nobody had any idea that I had a connection, a literal connection to that aftermath. So what I wanted to speak about today was dignity. I wanted to come from the true, what I believe is the ethos behind all of this thinking. And, um, and so with that, I thought what I'd do is I'd share with you what we say at the, at the birth of a child, at the severing of the umbilical cord. Um, other cultures came to our culture and, and taught us that the man, he stays away from the birthing process. And he gets with all the rest of the boys and they all have a beer at the local pub 
That's not my culture. So that's what happened with us. Whereas traditionally, the father was there with the mother through the whole process. Even young, young women were brought in to witness the whole thing so that they see the sacredness of, of birth, of procreation. And so what happens at the severing of that? I wanted to do that to honor this, um, this young girl that passed away. And um, what, what they say is, um, this, it's a chant that they do. It says, Pinne, pinne te kura, hau te kura. Ko te kura nui, ko te kura roa. And what that's saying is, kura means precious or sacred blood that spiraled down from the heavens from God. And that's what you're acknowledging at the, at, when you're holding the actual uh, pito, we call it, the umbilical cord, precious sacred blood. So any school that we have in our country is called a kuda. Kuda means precious or sacred blood spiraling down. So all of these youth that you see around and everyone being educated here, precious sacred blood. So what are we teaching them in places like this? That they're precious sacred blood that spiraled down from the heavens. So we don't have a problem with hierarchy. And I found out what hierarchy meant yesterday by our learned ones here, and I'm so grateful to hear what that is. It means righteous rule. So um, for us, I wanted to acknowledge this because I work for the Māori King in health. And um, I, I help to re-educate our people that are incarcerated to teach them about their precious sacred blood. Um, but many kingdoms keep a genealogy so that their families um, become elevated and everybody else back to peasants doesn't know that lineage. Um, but in my culture, everybody, it's requisite that they all know their lineage. Because, um, you know, when we talk about dignity for us as indigenous people, that's where dignity comes from, is knowing your lineage all the way back through your ancestors and then back to Eeyore. Eeyore is to us is the supreme creator. We have no problem, and I wanted to acknowledge our sisters that spoke yesterday on feminism. I wanted to share with you that the most sacred thing in our culture is woman, because woman stands at the same status as God, because she is able to create within her, within her body. And only, well, see, we have no problem with calling God, God either, because to us, Lord, all of these different words, they're not our words for it. But I wanted to share with you that that's how important things are. When we come into meetings, now what happens is we sit and the men sit over here on this side. The other men that are hosting sit on this side and all the women sit behind them. That's not even our culture. So people who, who view us, they say, oh, you're patriarchal. The women, women are um, inferior to the men. It's totally wrong. That's all from the English, that way of sitting like that. Like in courts, you see how everyone stands. Our culture, we all sit on the earth, on, on a, a woven mat where women and men all sit together. You see, so I just wanted to share with you some little simple things, but um, they're important to us. So can I get you there? I brought some technology where I can stand here and just sit there. But. So um, I wanted you to, if you see this, this is what's at the front of a, of a, of a canoe, of a vessel. And if you can look to the front there, you'll see that protruding tongue out of that. That actually represents the word of God. Because um, in our canoes, what we believe is that we call it the tau ihu. That's the first, the firstborn of the creator. And he goes before us. So what we look at is, as a, a canoe is a vessel that bridges land. It bridges all land to each other and it bridges us to each other. So the symbolism in that is the firstborn, our oldest brother. We have no problem with it. The firstborn in our lineage is called Tane Nui Arangi, which means the son. Tane means son or man. The son or man that was held in high esteem in the heavens. There's a physical manifestation of, of him, and that's the sun in the sky. Because the name of the sun in Māori is Tama, which means son or boy. Tama, T-A-M-A, -A, Tama, which means the sun that was held in high esteem in the heavens. So that's the light. Okay. This is a five hour presentation that I'll do in 20 minutes. This represents our ancestors. 
Um, and our people were taught not to make um, images look like a man or a woman. So what they did was they distorted the figures as not to offend the Creator because the Creator taught us not to make images and to worship things that don't breathe. If you've heard these stories before, this is all pre-European, all of these teachings here. If you look at, um, you can see the hand there moving up to the side there. If I had my pointer, I'd point at it right now. But you can, um, can you see those three fingers? Over here. Well, those are symbolic. Three to us is symbolic because we, we speak of, see, see, when Christianity came to us, we had no problem with it because they talked of a Godhead. And so we had no problem with that because that's the symbols of us, but it represents a pre-existence that we've all come from spiritually. And then we're here in this world here to be given mana. Mana is, is power, prestige. But mana is your rights to choose right from wrong for yourself. And so that prayer, the birthing prayer I was talking about, it says that you are precious sacred blood coming down. Pinde pinde te kura. Ho te kura. You are well traveled. So the, the child's spirit to us is eternal. So those young people that were all massacred, we believe that they were eternal before they came here. They're only in a young body. And they're young into, as to having experience here to choose right from wrong. So a newborn child to us that, that is um, taken at birth, you know, like uh, they call it cot death, a sudden infant death syndrome. They've got names for it. They're trying to find out what it is. We believe to us because we have faith that these, any being that comes to this earth that receives a body, it's fulfilled the part of its journey. So then it's able to go on to the next part of the journey because we are eternal beings, transcendent in time. But um, one thing that you must know from our culture is that if you are evil and practice unrighteous dominion while you're here in the flesh, that's exactly how you travel on into the next world. Does everyone understand that? So, yeah. Okay. If we can uh, this here represents... A rainbow it's at the back of a of a canoe uh, and it's got a big sort of a carve, uh, curve in it there to represent our ancestors because we we believe in uh Uenuku. we have a name for another name for god the god of the rainbow because we believe in the covenant that was given to us in the in the koperu or the uh, niwa niwa the rainbow is a sign of a covenant for us and it's about purity about keeping ourselves pure because our people are big on uh, purification ceremonies, that they'll immerse you totally in water to purify you. So if you've heard of that in your culture, it's not too different. Okay, next one. Uh, that's the top of the spiral. Uh, we believe here these symbols here. This is the top of that rainbow. But those symbols there to us represent that every, every human on this earth is blessed with this intelligence that we call Modi. And, um, you know, like you see some cultures have a third eye. They believe there's a third eye there. Well, we believe the intelligence of ear of God is in every single one living. There's not one person here that doesn't have a conscience. Um, the guy that uh, massacred those young people, we believe he has a conscience. You call it conscience. We don't call it conscience. We call it modi. But what we believe is that he never listened. He never listened because the word in our language to listen, uh, it, it, we say, um, we say hakarongu. It doesn't mean to listen. It actually means to be obedient to what the Spirit's telling you to do. And we believe that anyone who does anything um, so out there is actually not listening to that Spirit within them. So this whole time that we're here is about us listening to what the Spirit tells us to do. A good example is this morning when we woke up because we back back home in New Zealand right now it's about um, it's about six thirty or seven o'clock in the in the evening, and so my body um, waking up, my bo my spirit saying, "Oh, you got to get up, you got to get to this conference," but my body's saying, "Nah, man, just stay here." 
<laughs> Some, something's not right. But, but that's a good example of, of what, what the Spirit is uh, for us. You know the word aloha? Aloha, a lot of people know that greeting, aloha. You know what it really means? Alo alo is presence, in the presence of. So what I'd say to, in my language is I'd say, katuo, I stand imuai te aro aro, uh, in your presence. So aloha, ha is the spirit of God. Okay? So what you're saying is that wherever I stand and whoever I'm in contact with, that I'm able to um, live in a way that I could um, withstand the presence of God. So I'll be pono, I'll be honest, true, and I'll have true love. And that's how I'm meant to be with everybody. So that I, I, I look at you like I'm in the presence of the Supreme Creator. See, so when you hear the word aloha, people don't even know what we're saying. Ha is a name given to, um, to God. I o te ha manoa, the God who gives life uh, to your soul, to your whole being. And that's what all of these symbols mean. There's some symbols in here that you can't really see, but I can see because I know how to read it. But you will see this is, this is actually a hand over here, and it's holding on to one of those spirals. And that means that if you live your life and you, you don't take hold of the Spirit, that you're, you're, you're what you call one of those spirals. It's called a takarangi spiral. It means that you've come from the heavens, from a higher sphere to this world, but you're just here. You're just going every day and you're just here. But if you hold fast to things that are spiritual, what that means is that they become, they change, the name changes, and it means that you become eternal. So all of these little gaps you see, you can see light through here. That re represents eternity, because we're eternal beings. All those little gaps is what we learn each day, like what we learned yesterday, today, that we learn things bit by bit. Because we don't always think we might know everything. Hey, but if we think um, we have an elder who's an old man or a queer, an old lady, you've got to remember that in the, in the scheme of being eternal, they're actually young. Only the bodies become older. You know what I mean? Dignity, eh? So keep going. Let's see what we have here. Oh, we'll keep going. We'll fast forward this stuff here because I'm, I'm aware of the time here. So that's that, that's that takarangi spiral there representing that we are eternal. Here's another figure up here that's actually holding on to it. Keep going. So um, I just wanted to say for us, um, this, this is Tane here. And, and we believe that Tane sets as an example. We had a brother here from the camp rooms yesterday that said the legacy that he wants to leave is that he's an example to his family um, around the things that he believes in. And we call that um, a student in our schools, those precious, sacred blood spiraling down. We call a student a tauira. And tauira means um, an exemplary student, that you become an example of what you're learning. You know, a lot of us can go through school the whole way, like me. I, I had no desire to learn English at school. Because I thought to myself, why do I want to learn um, my colonizer's language for? You know? So well, what we're doing with our people that are incarcerated, we're unlearning them. We have to unlearn them all of the bad habits that we've picked up from a predominant culture that severed all of our ties to our identity. They, they've told us, how could you know about God? Eh? How can you know because you're a heathen? You, you, you live in a, in, a, in a house with no windows. You live in a hut. You live on the earth. But, um, you know, I tell you, I've learned through traveling that um, I learned this from these uh, Jewish people. Uh, once a year, they have a ceremony that they call, uh, I think it's called Sukkot. And what happens is um, the men go outside and they live in a little, uh, a little place that they put up and it's made out of just all natural things of wood and palms. And the idea of that is so that they remember when they were, um, when they were exiled and they were traveling in the wilderness. And it was so that they'd never forget that God had, had given them the basics of the world to live in, but he kept them alive. And you know what? That's exactly how the predominant cultures found us. We were living off the earth, 
sustainable. We all, you know, like people that don't like religion, they don't like tithing and things like that. We gave tithes. Everything was for each other. So we tithed. We believed in those laws. And I just wanted to share with you that that's exactly how the English found us when they came. But what they did naturally was they saw our carvings and they thought we were idol worshippers. So most of our carved buildings, if you can keep going till we get a building, that's what a canoe looks like. This one here holds 200 people. My nephew took this, got this photo for me when they did this PowerPoint. He said that was me there. I had a good look. That's not even me. That's a tourist. But keep going. Okay. This is, this is the, our meeting houses. This is our, like, our tabernacle or place that we come to. Uh, the ancestor on the top there, I can recite my genealogy to him. I'll do 76 lines of genealogy and I'll come to him. He's the first person that came from Hawaii into, uh, into New Zealand. So he's got that paddle there. Now, if you can see <coughs> coming down, um, the English, they, they saw because the, the male genitalia what they saw was this was uh, blasphemy. So they actually ordered for all of our meeting houses to be burnt down. Um, over the doorway, uh, we have a woman carved over the doorway with female genitalia open. But that's symbolic that when we all enter into this, this house, that we've all come from the same mother. So we come in and we're, we're fed spiritually by everything that happens, like what we're doing now. So that when you come out of there, you're coming and you're born again, coming back into the world out there, because that's where opposition is. Okay? So that's what that whole thing is about. It's no different to um, our First Nations brothers that go into sweat lodges. They, they get down on their hands and knees, and it's symbolic of re-entering the, the womb of the mother. So people who think our cultures are, are, um, are patriarchal, they've got it all wrong because they don't know us. They look from the outside, but they have no idea about the symbolism in our culture. So um, the big face that you see here, see all of these little faces there that come down from the male genitalia? Those are all the different, because our people recorded that so they could recite every ancestor. So um, I should have my little pointer so I could give you a demonstration. But if you looked at all of those, can you see all the little tongues coming down? Those are all different ancestors that come right down to here. So what they do is um, they'd say, Ka moi a rangi a papa ka putiki wahoko tu matau e nga tāna ko muri ranga whenua, ka moi a muri ranga whenua i a mahuika, ka moi a māke a uh, tūtara ka putiki wahoko māhui, tāna ko machu ko māia ko mākoro. We go on and on and on. I was brought up like that with ancestors that got up and when you saw them you went like this. Because oh. they were going to go on forever. Oh, yes. So that's... Um, so that's what they do there. And they're all, um, they also have walking sticks with the notches on them so you can recite your genealogy. They're not names written, but it's all done by memory. So I don't have a degree, just a pedigree. I like saying that at university because <laughs> I work with people that all have degrees, but I've got a pedigree. Okay, so this face here represents E or God. And this represents a mountain. That's why I said yesterday our ancestors didn't conquer mountains and put a flag on the top of it to say we, we conquered it. What they do is they stay just below the mountain to pay tribute to God, that he's above all things. And this, um, this above that face there, person, what, what that means is your ancestor was carried by God to this place. So if we get another a slide, you'll see that this represents a bird, and these are the wings of that bird. So God has actually carried our people to this land and given it to us, a land of our inheritance. So when the predominant culture came and they bought the Bible, and uh, our ancestors learned passages from the Bible, Ezekiel says, I'll carry on the wings of eagles. You'll walk, or you'll walk and not be weary, and run and not faint, or however it goes. Our people knew those, but we didn't record it in the Bible. It was written in our symbolism. Okay, so here's the doorway to, this is where the woman's carved over here. Okay, this is your first ancestor that came, and this is his first descendant that was established on that earth. And that earth wasn't, he didn't own the earth. 
He was a steward or a guardian of that so that he could look after other people that would come. Okay? Dignity, eh? Very dignified. Well, I think it is. Okay, next one. Oh, can I just show you one more? Go back again. Just here, if you look at this, can you see a bird? There's another bird beak here. That's an eye, and there's another one there. That's the head of a bird. That one there, this is your, this is Eo, the creator, and he's standing on this one over here. That's uh, the one he's standing on is uh, the god of opposition we call Tumatoena. That's the god of anger, the god of war. So the reason why it's at the lowest point on the ground is because outside of that sanctuary, that sanctuary, that's where um, the opposition is. As soon as you get out of, outside of your places of retreat, because this whole place here, next slide, represents the womb of our mother. This is our mother here. We call Papa Tuanuki. That's our mother. And that realm will go right to that big carving at the front, which is God. That's the Matapuna, the spring of all spirituality. All of us have come down, precious sacred blood. All of these symbols here are all your ancestors from the different tribes in New Zealand. Every tribe is represented here. And it shows that all of us have come from a mother and a father, heavenly father and a heavenly mother, and we've come down precious blood spiraling down from our ancestor here. So that's our story. But the most important part of this buddy, of this house, is the back pole. Because the back pole here represents the God of peace, which is the firstborn of us all. So you see, uh, I, you know, we, we've been trying not to talk about religion. I don't have a problem talking about religion, because to me, the, um, what I'm telling you here isn't religion, it's the faith of my people. That's what our people believe in. And um, I'm happy to stand before you all and say that, because my ancestors, they were actually driven from land to land to land because of what they had. That's what we believe until we were placed at a place where the Creator carried us and put us to be safe there to a, for a time when we can come back to these other nations and share with them who we are. Because that's the prayer I did at the beginning, was the gathering of all nations and all tribes so that they knew about these same things about dignity. Next one. Uh, has it again? Pura Pura Fetu, this is a name. This represents stars. This actually represents all of us that are here. We call it Pura Pura Fetu. I hit that again. So you can see how you spell that. Pura Pura means seeds that are sown all over the world. And that's why we know if, uh, they have a proverb in my culture. If I was to ask you what was the most important thing in the world, my reply to you would be, it is people. It is people. It is people. It doesn't say it's Maori people. It's native people. It's indigenous people. It says it is people. It is people. Because these are the symbols that we would number the sands of the seashore and the stars in the firmament. Traditional, pre-European. Keep going. There's only a couple more. The, um, our, our, we, we talk for five hours non-stop. So have you ever got bored with about a 20-minute speech where well, you've you got five hours of it? Um, this is the great ancestor here that that was the one who divided that water so we could pass. But the symbol of him is that his hands are held up like this because we're, we're taught of a battle that, that we were in to protect our faith. And his hands were held up and supported by others. So you might know those stories too. But um, we presented this to other people who have these same stories, but it's recorded and written in a different way. Okay, next one. This is the sea path I told you about. Can you see it there? That represents the waves that we came through. Next one. That's Alamona, where you be. The kau kau, that's a design of our families. You see in Hawaii, they have these designs carved tattooed down their faces, down their legs. But it's so you can recite all your lineage. Um, it's not a design to us. It's a way of recording your lineage. Okay, next one. And there, that's, this is the symbol of the family for us. So 
we at the at the top of our what we believe we have a heavenly father and a heavenly mother. And you know how you know that? Because you come from a mother and a father. That easy. There's, there's, there's nothing tricky for us. We just think it's so so simple, it's not even funny. You have a heavenly father and a heavenly mother. But I wanted to share with these sisters here. Because their English words um, don't don't describe what my language is saying. But we say this. The man's role, role is to preside. 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 The woman's role is to decide. Because they do that together. He, he has a role that he can do things that a woman can't do and vice versa. But he presides and she decides for him. Because they do that together. And the children, they reside. Does that make sense? Because I explained it in my language and a clever Māori who has a degree like a lot of you, he told me that's how you explain it in English. Preside and the woman decides together. Cause that's, see, Māori believe that the woman is taken from the, um, not from the bone that comes from the head where she would rule over the man. She, doesn't, she wasn't taken from the foot bone where man would stand over her but she was taken from the bone closest to the heart. That's, now, that's a proverb in my culture. Okay, next one. Is that dignifying? Well, I think it is. My teachers who taught me, one of them's still alive now. She's 107 years old, a matriarch. Never drank, never, never smoked, never used anything from the predominant culture. Eats our native traditional foods. And, and my teacher who died a few years ago, she was 105. Her brother's still alive now. He's a young fellow. He's 87. Okay. So that's the family for us. That rep represents our Heavenly Father, Heavenly Mother. And then this is man and this is woman on the same level. If you turn it upside down, which we do, what would you have? You would have a Heavenly Father and a Heavenly Mother and then the, you're the prodigy, the precious sacred blood that spirals down onto the earth. So it's your time to choose right from wrong for yourself. Next one. Uh, this is um, what they call Roi Matatoroa, which represents the tears of the albatross. The albatross is sacred to us. Um, and the reason for that, um, as you spoke yesterday, you talked about the bird's eye view. Well, um, our people believe that those <coughs> big birds are symbols of, of God because they can see everything and we can't see it. See, and I, you know, I know this is a very delicate subject, but this is coming to the end of it. But I wanted to say that um, with, this, with this tragedy that happened here uh, with these young people, you, you know what our people really believe? That innocent people suffer and pass away and die so that wicked people <coughs> can receive. I'm giving it to you in English and, and it doesn't sound as good as what it would sound in my language. But righteous people and innocent people suffer and pass away. They die. They lose their lives. So that a righteous judgment can fall upon those that do the, the evil. So I don't know if you can understand that but that's the best I can do it in, in my language because those young people are innocent and they go straight back in aloha into the presence of God. See, so when we're looking at it from there, of course it's sad, it's a tragedy, it's, a, it's terrible. But if you have faith and you believe in what we believe in, you actually see that that person who committed their crime, he was influenced, um, as the sister was saying yesterday, he was influenced by a whole, other, a whole lot of other evil factors. Now all of those evil factors will have their time. But it's not our time. Our time is to strive to do things to bring dignity back to the world so it never happens. Okay? So I didn't want to offend anybody by that, by saying these things. But culturally, that's how I'd explain it. So I'll finish with this, um, probably the last couple, because I think I've gone about seven minutes over. Uh, keep going. The next one. Do I? So this is the symbol, this is the symbol of the... Um, Albatross. And the albatross, um, when a child's born, 
what they do is they usually give the child feathers. And a feather of an albatross is so that the child is given dominion. You know what dominion is? See, because that's the English word again. We say kaitiakitanga, which means you're given stewardship or guardianship. Be a guardian. If you use the word dominion, people think that you're trying to stand over everybody else. But once again, that's not our language. Uh, stewardship. You're, you're given stewardship. So the symbol of the, the, the albatross's uh, feather is that you would be given stewardship and responsibility over everything on the sea. Because the, the toro or the albatross is, is, is the, it can go the furthest over the sea. Okay? And then the child is also given a, a feather from a bird we call the kaka. And that bird is a fluorescent kind of a green color. But that's a symbol of God. So that child is given responsibility over everything on the land. To be a guardian over everything on the land. Everything green and living on the land. It's symbolic. So that's what we're giving this precious sacred blood all the time. Responsibility to take care of these, these two realms. Okay? Excellent. Um, this is a Hawaiian ceremony that's pre-European. And if you look here, the staff here is called a Lono staff. Lono is the god of peace in our culture. Lono. Lono, we say pakarungo, uh, which means to be obedient, to listen to the spirit. So what you'll see here is you'll see two albatrosses this staff here has a carving on it that is the carving of the God of Peace. And either side there are two albatrosses, one either side, and they're hanging by uh, like a hangman's noose either side. So, um, sh show another slide. So that's the carving of Lono there. And there you see the two birds there. And on these scrolls here are uh, writings. So I know one of the first times I went to Hawaii, I was asked to come by some linguistics experts to look at the Hawaiian language to see if I could translate them, which is easy for us. Uh, the language is similar. But we know that in the celebration, the normal celebration, um, you know, we're called Polynesians. We're not Polynesian. That's a French person who called us Polynesian. And I feel sorry for my Micronesian brothers because they think it's terrible that they ca call Micronesia because their islands are already small. So the colonizers give them an even name that makes them even smaller. <laughs> you know, micro. It just shows you, eh? Okay, um, but what this is saying here is that we, we believe that there's going to be a return of the God of peace. We believe that. So those who uh, literally, literally believe in the second coming of Christ, we believe it. We believed it before the Bible came. When the Bible was brought to us, it reaffirmed what our ancestors knew. So I just want to say that because I've heard people say that I don't really want to talk about religion. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about my people. And you know what? This is the first time in our people's history that we're able to tell our story. So I want to thank all of those that have made it possible. Um, Uli, meeting you guys, and you know your family, and, and sister over here meeting you in, in Dunedin and to be able to teach about conflict resolution and how, how our ancestors were the forefathers of conflict resolution 50 years before Gandhi. And you know, like I say that with humility, but what we're doing is we're trying to bring back the knowledge that we believe that all mankind had. All of us have this knowledge and these pockets of this knowledge, uh, one of our wise elders back here told me how many languages there were in the world. And, and I just wanted to say that amongst all of those different kindreds, those nations and tongues, um, they have this knowledge that we're talking about. So um, we knew that those two there, we believe that we were actually taught by the resurrected Christ. That's what we believe. Once, once Christianity came. So I wanted to leave with that so that you are very sure that when you think of New Zealand and you think of a Maori from New Zealand, most people think of our haka, we're known from a, a war dance that we do before we play rugby, but nobody knows what that haka means. We're actually singing about the God of peace, and they think we're trying to scare people. 
We say kamate, kamate, kaura, kaura means if I die, if I die, I live, I live, I'm eternal. Says te nei te tangata puhuru huru. They speak of this hairy man. Who is this hairy man? Na na itiki mai fakafiti tera. He would usher in the coming of the noonday sun. So you know when when our people read about John the Baptist preparing the way for for Christ, our people just put all it was like connecting all the dots to who we were. And then it says upane kaupane upane u means the word kupu is word, and then kaupane is ko is our is our lineage straight back to God. So we're talking about the word of God and God. So I just wanted to share share that with you. That no one knows what we're doing when we're doing our haka. You know, they're all here. Yeah, they, you know, people, especially in South Africa, if there's some South Africans here, they make so much noise so that they can't hear what we're doing, and they don't realise they all gathered in the beginning and they were doing a prayer. You know, quietly, and we're just another nation that does it a different way. And that's all I wanted to share with you: is don't let us be too quick. Um, to pass judgment on how people pray and how they worship because if you if you really look into our cultures and the symbolism you'll find that we are very dignified our dignity comes from God and I want to share that with you and I'll finish by singing a song thank you and don't clap because I know that a lot of European people clap <laughs> We say kia ora. <laughs> and kia ora, kia ora means um, effervescence to eternal life. We're wishing you all eternal life. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll sing the song. I've sung it already here, but I'll sing it because um, everyone and them, they know that I don't um, return emails. <laughs> they, 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 they send me messages that are long like this, and I'll send back like, thank you. <laughs> but um, what I'll do is I'll sing the song that it's touching on what you spoke of before about um, how we talked about um, world citizenship. So this is a Bob Marley song and it's called War. Not a good song to sing in a peace way, but if you listen to the words, they're all about it. Until the philosophies which hold one race superior than another Inferior is finally and permanently discredited and abandoned Everywhere is war, me say war, until they're no longer first class and second class citizens of any nation, until the color of a man's skin is of no more significance than the color of his eyes. Me say war until they day dream of lasting peace world citizenship will remain in but a fleeting illusion to be pursued but never attained but never attained War up north, war in the south. Yeah, I got the words wrong, hang on. Until the ignoble and unhappy regimes that hold our brothers bondage in Angola, in Mozambique, South Africa, top of human bondage. Up and toppled, totally destroyed. 
someone punches you in the eye playing rugby and you've got to go off, it's interchange. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is there any questions? Don't, don't, be, don't be shy. As my uncle would say, I'll answer any question culturally, any question you have. And if I can't think of an answer, just give me a second and I'll make one up. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, so the, I, I work in, um, in every prison in New Zealand. Um, and what I do is, is I, um, I teach identity, everything that I was talking about now. But I teach this also in Hawaii, in every prison in Hawaii that will let us in there. And um, our, our role in uh, educating our people about their history, their culture, principles and values is um, me and a few other people back home, we're committed to, um, to closing down the prison system. Because the uh, prison system, currently there's 5,000 of my people incarcerated in New Zealand. 5,000. And so the prison system makes $500 million a year off incarcerating my people. Uh, the government gave my people back $760 million to help fix up all the problems. <coughs> so if you have a look at that, it's disproportionate. About $500 million per capita is used on warehouse. The Hawaiians, currently now the prisons are all full in Hawaii and people are being sent to mainland America, to Oklahoma, Red Rock and Sagoya prison, two prisons made to incarcerate our people where they don't learn about their culture, their history, but they're put into places there where the prison business will make big money because they lock them up. You don't do much therapy, and most of the therapy that, that they're given is Western social, uh, Western social science therapy, therapeutic models that in our culture and recorded really well, um, it, it increases incarceration of our people by 44%. Our cultural interventions are spiritual interventions, they're faith-based. See, because that's what the predominant culture is telling us what we're doing. They're, they're telling us that we're using a faith-based intervention. Well, to me, you can call a pin a tail on it and call it a donkey. I don't mind, because it's, it's helping our people to come out of there and not go back again. So my, my real passion is to, um, to help Policing, to reduce policing, reduce courts, and reduce prisons. Um, social welfare, social welfare, I'm anti that. Because those are all systems brought in to help our people, but they made our people more dependent. We already had dependencies on alcohol and drugs, but we come from a culture where we're actually self-sufficient. So our self-determination to be self-sufficient is right at the forefront of, of what I do. Right? Any, anyone else got a question? Don't be shy.
here. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Um, we, we have evidence. Um, yeah, we, we have evidence everywhere that shows that, um, you know, when you, when you sever people from that identity, um, they have no respect. Uh, the sad part is, is that um, our people hate the system, but most of our crimes are on <coughs> each other. See, because you're living in a society where you, they've placed you into different places as part of their town planning by social design. We were urban people. All of us were, uh, were rural people, but we've been urbanised. So we, we have been displaced. Um, and where we were traditionally on our lands, so you, you lose all of those skills. But no, there's evidence left, right and centre. Evidence coming out of the woodwork, and that's why they have to take us seriously now. Yeah. The other yeah. country, you know, you know what um, you do w with our men because I predominantly work with men, but I'm um, just, just recently I'm, I'm in the biggest women's prison in New Zealand, yes. Um, that just started four weeks ago. Mm -hmm. But with our men, uh, suffering from you know, because domestic violence, mm -hmm. um, anger management issues, and and 80 80 percent of it is all alcohol and drug induced, you see. So, so we have to look at those, um. See, it's not the alcohol and drugs either, because there's, uh, there's, those are symptoms, symptoms of, of loss of identity and loss of spirituality. But um, I, I wanted to say, when, when we go into to work with our people, you know, they're viewed as being hardened criminals. But um, that's very much a mask, a front, and you know that from psychology. Um, but what, what I say is, we also use a, a faith-based intervention because culturally what we do is we pray we pray before we go in but we also what we call we nohopuku which means that we fast so we sacrifice eating so that we believe that um, when you eat you're feeding your body your physical so how many times do we feed our spirit you see so so when we don't eat what we're doing, we believe, with God is we're sacrificing our own wants and putting these people we're working with first. So when we speak to them, we're speaking straight to their heart, spirit to spirit. And, and I think that's uh, it's very hard for a lot of people to understand, but we believe in that. That's how I was taught. That's how I was taught to re retain genealogy. Um, e even though I say I don't have a degree, but I have a pedigree, is, is that you do it through prayer and fast. That, that these things, this, um, what do you call it, the paranormal. The paranormal to my people is normal. is um, in, in our culture there's a word that they use now they have a, a language commission that the govern, government commissions our people to come up with the words to match an English word and there's a, there's a great danger in that 
Um, but the word that they use for suicide back home, suicide ideation, is called whakamomoritanga. And, and what that means, it actually means to be, you know how you, um, you can be away from your family, like to be here, those that have come from all over. What that means is that um, you are, you are kind of like um, lonely, you're bereft, okay? So, um, and, that, and that leads you into depression. It can. But see, the actual word, there's, there's two types of being bereft and lonely. There's one where you're lonely because of love. And there's another one where you're beyond lonely, so it turns into grief. You see? So there's a positive and a negative. But that's not the word for suicide in our language. The word for suicide in my language is called kōhuru. And you know what kōhuru means? It means murder. It means that you've murdered yourself. And culturally, you know, being <coughs> acculturated and not knowing, in our culture, if they're taught that their precious sacred blood that's spiraling down from the heavens, that your period of time on this earth is to gain intelligence, because we believe the glory of the glory of God is intelligence. We're here to gain experience, e even with the um, the ups and downs. We believe that they're consecrated for your benefit, <coughs> not not so. Suicide uh, is murder in our language, and we're teaching that to our people <coughs> so that they're very clear. So I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a lot of uh, youth suicide in our country because they don't know these things we're talking about, especially with young Māori women, more than ever before. So what happens is um, youth that go to school, when they see um, another classmate or friend has committed suicide, at the funeral, our funerals are really different back home. They say we're like the Irish. We sing a lot, get up and dance. And, and so what happens is when youth see a funeral for someone who's committed suicide, they actually start thinking, man, that's this, this not a bad option. Because everybody's saying, oh, you shouldn't have done it and all the rest of it. But they still see the outpouring of love. See, and, and that's what our youth are following. You see, and that's why we had five in a row, because they're seeing the outpouring of love. But it's still not our culture. They're seeing one part of our, our culture, which is the outpouring of love because of what, what's happened. But we have to then show that outpouring of love in demonstrating our everyday life rather than only showing it when there's a tragedy. So, so we, we believe that, because um, I've done work for SPINS, which is suicide prevention um, in New Zealand, and they actually don't like what we have to share culturally because they, they, they're telling us, the predominant culture in New Zealand is telling us that we need to just accept suicide that suicide is going to be part of our lives and we won't, we won't accept it because we believe that we should be teaching them that it is very, very selfish, matapiko we call it in our language, to kill yourself because no one else should kill you. So then why should you then kill yourself? Okay? Okay. Is that all right? Okay, I'll round up with it. Um, if I could leave you with a, with a, with a proverb. It may be longer, not just one proverb. Okay, <laughs> I'll leave you with a couple of proverbs. But um, <laughs> this this is one this is one that we say. Uh, this is this is pre pre colonization, and um, our ancestors believed this. Um, I'd leave a blessing upon you all. That's how you finish. And what they'd say is, I'll say it in my language, me angatu o koutou titiro ki ngā kārohi rohi o tamanu te rā. Kei taka i muri a koe he atakura, kei reira wai ho ngā mea pauri, ngā raru raru o ina nahira. And what that means is, cast your eyes to the rays of the sun, and behind you will fall a shadow. Um, there, you, in that shadow, you leave all of the things you've done wrong. All the problems and the woes of yesterday, leave them in your shadow. That's the first part. That's nice, eh? If you're, work, if you're working with inmates, they love that. 
Hey, because um, a big part of, of punishment for us is forgiveness. You know? Anyway, this other, other, other proverb says that um, when you look up, once, once you know you've left all those problems behind you, you're then able to look directly at Pautu Te Marotanga, which is the noonday sun. Because the noonday sun to us is symbolic of, of God, the brightness of the noonday sun. God. That's what heaven's about to us. And so if you are able then to look directly up to the sun, what would happen is the shadow is actually hidden under your feet. You can't see anything. Is that nice? <laughs> well, if you're like a person like me that's made heaps of mistakes, that's the beautifulest thing you could ever hear. <laughs> so kia ora. Yeah. Yeah.